This is a lockdown booty call. A lockdown booty call. Hello and welcome to Lockdown Booty Calls. My name is Robin Boot. This is episode 10, which happens to be the last episode in season one of Lockdown Booty Calls. But fear not, I will be back again, coming in your ears and on your screens with season two at some point in the future. And rumour has it, it's going to be even better than season one. In the meantime, why not go back and check out some of the other episodes from season one and maybe even share them with friends or family or anybody who might be interested. In this episode, I could not have asked for a more fantastic guest. He's been a familiar face on our screens for 20 years. He won a Paralympic medal in Sydney and was awarded an MBE. He's also written three absolutely brilliant children's books. This is episode 10 of Lockdown Booty Calls with none other than Adi Adipitan. Adi, welcome to Lockdown Booty Calls. It's a pleasure to see your face. How are you doing today? Uh, um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm even happier now. I'm getting a booty call from you. I'm glad I can hear your service. uh, yeah, I take anything I can get right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I know I spoke to your um, your your fantastic uh, partner in crime. Did you see oh, that reflex? That that's from my partner in crime. She just threw a sock at me. If you only listen to the podcast version of this, uh, you should tune into the webcast because we're about thirty seconds in and it's all gone crazy. Uh, forget about it again, crazy. Did you see the cat-like reflexes? that I used to catch that, that, that sock. It was, yeah, I was talking to you. Yeah, cat-like reflexes. Yeah, so I, I left that to you. I left that to you, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Dramatic fashion. It's all, all downhill from now on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, yeah, where were we? Oh, podcast. That's what we were doing. Um, yes, that's what we know we're you're an incredibly busy man. Uh, normally, you're traveling around the world filming documentaries or writing books, which we've already touched upon the cyborg cat and I think we know where that comes from already after seeing that sock <laughs> catch. Um, what would you normally be doing uh, if the lockdown weren't in place? Oh if the lockdown weren't in place um, I would probably be in some far distant country um, making a documentary or filming the travel show um, on the other side of the world or in a different continent. Um, my job Fortunately for me, the last five, six years has been very much travel based. And I think on average, I would do about 20 to 24 countries a year. Um, I'd probably do, yeah, about two countries a month. Um, So yes, right now I would probably be in Africa or in Asia or America um, filming a doc. So the fact that lockdown is in place has basically reduced your carbon footprint. We can thank the, uh, the pandemic yeah. for, for helping the yes. environment purely through your, well, well, your lack of work. Well, it, I mean, it's even more um, uh, prescient and, and uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, even more apt because I, the documentary I was making was a, a climate change documentary. So yes, it's um, the, the, the fact that it's cut down my, my carbon for, but not just mine. I mean, I think compared to uh, most people, I, I think my carb, even though I do travel um, a lot, I kind of think the other parts of my life sort of help to negate some of that. Um, but yeah, it's that the whole world has basically um, cut down their carbon footprint. You know, the traffic out on the streets, uh, the planes, um, you know, even the transport of goods around the world has cut it all down. So yeah, they, that, that's the, um, the, the positive part of lockdown and COVID. And I think it shows that um, we can adapt our lives to help the environment and to prevent these things. We, we take so much for granted, whether it's hopping on a, a cheap flight to a, a foreign destination or just ordering ordering goods from all over the place or jumping in a car and when it's just as easy to get on a bike or source local goods i think Mm. it is a as you said a a real positive and hopefully we will be able to adapt going forward yeah it's uh, i mean it, it, it it's a it's a big topic climate change i think um yeah we talk about We talk about COVID, we talk about so many of the massive social issues going on in the world, which I think are super, super important and super prescient right now. But for me, 
looming in the background, the biggest uh, issue that mankind faces right now is climate change. Yeah, and there's no escaping from it. We can push it to one side. We can distract ourselves with lots of different um, uh, side matters, you know, like the economy, like um, pandemics, all of that stuff. But we're not going to escape from rising sea levels and desertification and uh, population growth. And at, at some point, we have to do something about it. Otherwise, um, we're in a whole world of, of doo-doo. A whole world of doo-doo. Okay. Yeah, you can see, yeah, you're you used go. to being a uh, children's presenter at <laughs> one point as well. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 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 but put it in terms that everyone could, uh, put it in terms that everyone can understand yeah deep do yes. actually on to um yeah just going on to your sort of tv side of things you you're saying you be you go to 20 to 24 countries a year you've seen incredible things um uh, all your your recent series in africa i remember also watching uh, the one about cuba um yes which was the basketball basically. players yeah yeah and it's real sort of diverse subject matters from climate change to poverty um, and culture and just general travel as well. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any sort of moments which really stand out from, from your career that make you go, wow, I never saw things that way? I think it's not so much I never saw it that way because um, I think all of us know that there are shocking things going on around the world and that there are inequalities in, in the world. Um, we all know it deep, deep down. Uh, we've seen it. We, 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 we sense it because we can feel um, uh, maybe just a tiny sort of flavour of what that's like in our own countries. Um, but it's actually going and meeting some of these incredible people who are dealing with uh, um, just unimaginable circumstances and meeting them face to face and actually spending a couple of weeks in their life that's when you it really hits you and, and so not not so much surprise but um just more shock at the fact that we allow stuff like this to happen so in terms of um moments that stick in my mind um i made a documentary I think it was 2014, I went to Jamaica and I made us, uh, it was part of a series uh, called Unreported World for Channel 4. Yeah. And I made, um, one of the episodes was uh, about, we called it uh, Jamaica's Underground Gays. And it was about a group of gay, transgender, transsexual guys who were all forced, or people who were all forced to live in a storm drain in Kingston, Jamaica, um, because of prejudice, because of their sexuality, because of fear for their lives. Um, a lot of them had been forced uh, out of their homes from the ages of 10, 11, not by their parents, but more for fear of persecution uh, of their parents. They left to protect their parents because they were being um, persecuted by, by other locals when they found out about their children's sexuality. And just to see these guys uh, or these people, sorry, living in 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 these wretched conditions, yeah. um, what, what was just awful. But also, what really touched me is quite a lot of the abuse they were getting was from the church. Um, you know, from people who were I don't know they, they the way they um, translated uh, religious scriptures in their head meant that these that that if you were gay or you you decided to change your uh, go for a gender reassignment then you're an abomination um uh, to the extent that these guys that their, their life their, their lives were under threat um but even with all of this sort of persecution all of this violence every sunday and i it still sticks to in my head one of them chrissy would hold a church service um and there would be local Christians who would come, who are really nice people, tra who travel, uh, travelers, to who found out about this community, and they would hold a church service in a storm drain. So whilst all, and it was in a really affluent area in Kingston. So whilst all these people are going about their lives, 
you know, we're earning their money, living their lives, so going to church, um, having clean water to, to, to bathe in and, and eating good food. These guys were amongst rats and their own feces doing a church service in a storm drain. And I remember there singing with them, being, I remember being there singing with them and, and seeing them saying, you know, um, it's not God's fault that people are like this, you know, and it's not our fault and we still have our faith. And it was just a moment that sticks in my mind. Uh, I can still see it now. It was just amazing. Wow. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that. That sounds, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not great to be speechless on a podcast, to be honest. But, but... <laughs> I mean, I, I see many, many, many moments like this um, traveling around the world where, you know, you just meet people in just, just really shocking conditions but the human spirit and uh, the, the 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 type of resilience that these people have is just incredible it's incredible and and it gives me hope actually for the human race you know to to meet people who are who are living in such adverse conditions having to deal with so much um difficulty but yet they find a glimmer of hope you you just answered the question I was going to ask whether you left feeling you know hopeful and inspired or uh, downhearted because they sound like the, the worst possible inhumane conditions that you wouldn't wish to see animals in those conditions. Yes. If you saw a, a yeah. dog suffering in those conditions, you'd probably take it in or at least phone a rescue shelter. But humans who don't necessarily adhere to the code of life that you choose to um, to stick to just completely dehumanized yet as you said singing in those storm um storm drain that, storm that drain. experience wow just to see that yeah hope in the in a completely hopeless place is really quite moving you know what you know you know what booty yeah it, it's moving it's inspiring it's, it's so many life affirming so many positive um superlatives i could throw at those moments um but <laughs> What disheartens me and what um, frustrates me is then when I come back home and I, and, and, you know, sometimes I have to check myself because I know people's issues are their issues, you know, and it doesn't matter how big or how small they are for an individual, you know, if it feels like a big problem, then it's a big problem. But what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of alluding to is I, I, I come back to the UK and, um, yeah, and I'll suddenly hear people on the radio moaning about just things that I kind of think are just pointless, you know, yeah. things that I just kind of think are just absolutely ridiculous and, and, and people taking for granted things that most people, many people around the world die for, you know, the fact that we can turn on our taps in this country and get clean water. You know, most people don't, most people don't even think twice about that. You know, many countries that I've got, I go to, um, the people spend their whole day bringing water home. You know, they, 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 the kids will get up at five in the morning and they will walk five, six miles in 30 or 40 degrees in, in certain parts of Africa, certain parts of South America and go to uh, a, a water pump um, uh, uh, watering hole, fill up these containers and then walk back home. That's like a four hour part of their day taken up just to have enough water to last the day. And then they'll go to school uh, or make breakfast for their family and clean up the house. And then they'll go to school, they'll study and they have to get home and they'll have to study because they haven't got electricity. So they have to study before it gets dark. So they have to study really quickly and then they'll go to bed and they'll get up and they'll do the whole thing again. So when I see people living that type of life and then I come here and I hear people moaning about um, teachers and our education system or the NHS or, yeah. you know, the, 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 the traffic, it, it frustrates me. It does frustrate me. And I have to sometimes recalibrate my brain um, in order to, 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 to kind of understand it. And, and also just the fact that 
many, many, many people care about what's going on in the in, in these places and other countries, but I think too many people don't. No, I, I fully agree, and it, it makes me question. You know, I get frustrated if I if my Wi-Fi drops out, and I could have much. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the same. I'm I'm, I'm the same, and and it's that you should you should be frustrated. You have yeah. every right to be, but we should also. Um, fight for the right for other people to 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 get to that position as well. Yeah, and we should also, yeah. yeah. When, and, when and everyone in the world can uh, be in a position where they can get frustrated at uh, shitty Wi-Fi conditions, then we yes. uh, then we've achieved something. Exactly. Namaste to that. Yeah. And Wi-Fi for all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good. I think that's that, that should be the motto. Yeah. yeah. Not 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 equality for all. Bad Wi-Fi for all. I think it is with my provider. I won't mention them, but uh, they, they seem to be on the case already. Um, I feel like we could talk about your travels and um, your documentaries and just your experiences for hours and hours, but we are in a, quite a short podcast. We'll probably have to get you on in series two or something like that um, to, to go into Feel free. I'm here. I'm here. I'd, if your um, Wi-Fi allows it. <laughs> I'd like to chat to you about how you have adapted during lockdown which has been going on for i think it's about is it six six million years now it feels like yeah it um, feels like it feels I've like seen, it was the ice age when, yeah, yeah when we were out of it i think we're into the second one i'm getting a bit chilly i think we've uh, we've done that <laughs> but i know it has been a bit of a roller coaster for everybody and you're normally incredibly busy if you're not jetting around the world somewhere filming a documentary or involved in a charity project or writing a book i know we, we chatted before recording your diary has been <laughs> weirdly empty and you're not quite sure what to do it but i've seen i've seen you doing all sorts online mm. i'm just wondering how you have adapted and and channeled your normal creative focus into being productive during this period um yeah it's been an interesting time and and initially because uh, right at the beginning, I, I was actually very ill. And um, I think, well, I haven't been tested, but I think I did have COVID. You know, all the symptoms seem to align. Um, but uh, so, so, so what I'm saying is that took me out for probably the best part of two weeks. So I wasn't really interested in doing anything other than um, feeling sorry for myself, eating soup and playing computer games, which uh, my other half, I uh, wasn't too <laughs> pleased about. Um, and also the fact that I'd lost my sense of taste meant that everything she cooked, I just was like indifferent about, which she wasn't too pleased about. Either. Isn't that but, normally the case? I've, I've, <laughs> no, Al's no, cooked no, she a couple of times. <laughs> uh, she cooks tasty, tasty morsels. What, what are you saying? Everything is cordon bleu. Um, but it, yeah, so it meant that the first two weeks really took care of themselves. Um, then after that, I kind of um, felt, yeah, this is a good time for contemplation, a good time to to just stop, to pause, um, and and relax. But then the restless part of my nature took over, um, the creative side of it, and 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 the fact is, I I heard a really good saying. I I can't even remember how it was line for line, but it's just the fact that um, creative people can never be bored. You know, because if you are creative, there is always something going on in your mind that will stop you from being bored. If you're a true creative, if you're, re if you're really um, allowing the process to, to take hold of you. Um, and, and, and I think that's myself. I, I can't be bored because, you know, whether I have uh, a, an, a, an Xbox or a PlayStation in front of me or whether I have nothing, I, my imagination will do the work. Um, and so I started thinking about different things that I could do. Um, my other half of you know, Elle, um, she uh, has been badgering me to do live streams on, on she kept saying, you've got to do live streams. You've got to increase your presence on, on, on social media. And I kind of, uh, I, I was of the, of the mindset that I spend a lot of my time in front of a camera on TV, you know, working all the time. Why would I want to do this at home as well? You know, it just means that I never stop working because can, although my job is no, by no means a difficult job and it, yeah, I will not compare it to many of our frontline workers and people out there who do proper, real tough jobs, it still does tax you mentally. And so just for me to think, oh, 
well to to spend all my time at work being on camera and constantly having my brain ready to go to do stuff and then come home and then do it again um well, i just didn't see the point in it but um she convinced me and also i just started to think yeah it's good it's a good idea there's a lot of kids who are at home a lot of parents who are probably going bonkers looking after these kids um trying to homeschool them uh trying to entertain them and i've got these books that i've written yeah and and also not enough people know about the books and here's a way of killing two birds with one stone you know increase my social media presence um and get the book out there and mm -hmm. and, and help entertain families during lockdown so yeah she um it, it almost feels to me like uh l um instigated lockdown on purpose just to get what she wanted <laughs> Be on ah, live so we stream. found the, the cons conspiracy <laughs> theories are rife. <laughs> in Forget the China. Time. It happened here. <laughs> <laughs> happened, happened in West London. Watch out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Or fairly soon. And um, yeah, so you know, I saw, especially in the early days, you were doing that. Was it every day you were doing the readings? It was, it was nuts. So I was doing yeah. a live stream. I was doing a live stream on um, my Instagram, Instagram live, uh, uh, doing, reading a chapter a day from my, um, my book, uh, The Rise of the Parsons Road Gang, which I have here, which uh, you, you can describe to the, to, to the listeners. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's book one. And so I decided to read a chapter a day from that. And then I was going to read for all the books. But um, I, I basically, I think I did 20 days on the trot of reading from the book. Um, it, uh, initially, I thought I'd just do maybe a, a few chapters and see how it goes. But it, the response was great. I had such a good response. There was amazing feedback. And then I started getting guests on. I started having competitions on, on, on the show. And it started to take over my life, I think, for about three <laughs> weeks is all I did. I remember speaking to Elle when you were doing it and she was saying that you, you're so absorbed by it. It felt like a full... Well, you, you know what it's like? Um, you, you, you moan and moan about something and say, oh, I don't want to do it. And then when you start doing it, you, you, the first moment you do it, you sort of kind of enjoy it. I love TV. Yeah. I love what I do. You know, it's it, for me, after sport, I think it's the most natural fit for my personality because I enjoy communicating. Um, and so well, when, once I made the live stream, I did the first one, I kind of started thinking in my mind, what way, how can I improve it? How can I make it more entertaining? How can I do stuff to make the, 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 the viewer, the listeners enjoy the experience? And so that started taking yeah. up every day. And I would, I would critique myself after every live stream and think, how can I make it better? And that's where it started to become absorbent. But that's, that's that personality that some of us have who are creatives. If you've got that character and you will always be your, your biggest critic and always looking to try and make it better, it'd be very easy to switch on, on your phone, read a chapter, switch it off again, and you know, Bob's your uncle. Whereas if you're constantly seeking perfection, whereas perfection is always impossible, it's, it's, it does take it out of you. It's very demanding. And yeah, it may not be working on a hospital ward for 16 hours, but it still, it still takes a lot of brain power, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Andy, can you just, for those of people who haven't heard of the book, can you just give a brief summary? Because you've got three out now, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I've got, I, I've got three out. Um, they just happen to be here right now. Uh, yeah, do you, do you have them dotted around the house just in case you have uh, video I, calls I, I, with people? I, 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 I have one. <laughs> have one in every corner of the house. Uh, it's every house should come with these books, actually. Um, so it stays on warehouse space, does it? <laughs> <laughs> series series of books um it, it, the cyborg called the cyborg cat um series and uh yeah book one is uh it's about a young kid called addy uh who a uh, familiar name and uh who, who moves who, he has a disability he moves from nigeria to east london um and uh, one of the big most difficult things as a child as anyone is dealing with change. And the book talks about what it's like to change, to move from a completely different country, have to learn a new language, have to try and make a new set of friends. Um, and then also deal with the fact that you're different. Um, you know, young Addy was, uh, is the only disabled kid in his school and he's trying to make uh, new friends. He, he looks different, he speaks differently. Um, 
and he uh, in trying to make new friends he, he he makes a group of friends who are all different as well um shed brian dexter and they all stand out they're not the coolest kids in the school and they discover that addy is really good at sport and he has a superpower and he uh when he plays sport he turns or when he's uh, being challenged he turns into this superhero character uh, called the cyborg cat and so the whole series of books are about the adventures of addy the cyborg cat um, and the Parsons Road Gang, um, and you know how they go and solve all these mysteries, how they overcome all of these challenges. But at the heart of it, it's about friendship. It's about saying that it's okay to be different. It's okay um, if you don't fit with the norms of society, and that you know friendship is the thing that gets you through all of this and and i think it's just an important message to get out there to kids and to just to say to, to to kids that no matter who you are you know where you come from you know if you have a disability whether you're male or female you can be a superhero you know you can be a cyborg cat um and we all have that superhero in us and and there's lots of humor in it they get up to lots of silly stuff as well as the serious stuff and the illustrations are amazing as well. Yeah, I was going to mention those. It's really, uh, really come together as, a, as a, a full package, isn't it? And it's fun and funny, but with a, with a powerful message. And what, what's the yes. sort of the target age range you're looking at? Do you so, think? So the so I think if you're a good reader, if the kids are good readers, it's I'd say six. The sweet spot would be six to nine, but okay. I think it can it, it, you can go up to as high as twelve. But ultimately. I've, I've written my books because I want them to be a book that kids read with their parents. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's very much a neglected thing that um, children and parents I, I, I read together. I, I kind of think parents sometimes, I mean, I, it's easy for me to say I'm not a parent, but I get the feeling that sometimes parents see books as a pacifier, as a way to keep the kids quiet you know, and give themselves some free time. But I really feel that, you know, there are some challenging moments in the book, but there's also some hilarious moments in the book. Initially, it was young boys we were targeting because um, there's a real problem of getting with getting young boys to read books. Um, I don't know what it was, what, 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 whether there were other things that they found they were more interested in. So, you know, when I was working with my publishers, we were we initially targeted young boys but you know as I wrote I, I'm, I'm quite a universal writer so I felt that you know th there's plenty of interest in it because there's sport uh, which young boys like young girls like reading books about sport as well it, um, you know most of the Parsons Road gang are boys but later on Melody who be, who's the best actually the best footballer amongst the gang she joins them later on touching so, on what it, you were saying about reading the book with parents it sounds like there's some big issues which should be fantastic conversation starters so and actually be very important for parents to discuss with their, their kids at the same time not just for the kids to absorb it themselves because there are a lot of issues in the world today uh, which my generation our generation maybe aren't as in touch with whereas young kids from you know six to nine to, to to older they may be slightly more aware of the the issues going on at school but parents aren't fully um as aware i think i i, I think i i think you're really you, you, you're right there booty and you've touched on something which i'm you know i i hope subtly i'm hinting in the book in that a lot of children's books, they, I, I, I don't criticize them. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying they, the way children's books were kind of written were um, quite almost in a simplistic term. You know, you had a hero, you, you had a good guy, you had a bad guy. Um, and then sort of most of the time, they live, all live happily ever after at the end. Um, and they might touch, some of the books might touch on prickly issues, but they were very surface, um, at the surface. In my books, you know, the, we touch on racism, we touch on bullying, we touch on uh, identity, we touch on um, disability. 
many, many, many really, really difficult, um, uh, not really difficult, but topics that are there, that are in yeah. our everyday lives. And, um, you know, I, I, I add humour. They're all part of the story. We're not, I'm not shoehorning them in, you know, for just for the sake of them being there. They, they are there and, and you know, they're, they're the things that happen in these kids' lives. And I want the kids to read them and sometimes they might not quite understand what is going on. Well, they understand it, but the, the thing is they'll ask that question that all kids ask is why? Yeah. Why is someone saying these horrible words about someone just because they're disabled or because of the color of their skin? You know, why are people not wanting girls to play football uh, or, 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 and stuff? And I want that, that's the reason why I want parents to be there to help and sort of navigate these issues with the kids together. Now, the, the, the thing is some parents might think, oh, this is chore. This is the last thing I want to be doing, sitting here talking about these complicated topics like race and, and bullying with my kids. But this is the question I want to ask the kids, I mean, to parents. Would you rather your children get the answers to these questions off social media or from perfect strangers? Or would you like, like to sit there and yourself impart that knowledge and, and speak to them about it? You know, and I think it's far better for you as a parent even if you don't totally know the answer yourself, to try and come to a solution or come to an answer together with your children whilst reading the books and whilst having a laugh at some of the fart jokes that I've inserted in the book. <laughs> Racism <laughs> and farts, I mean, they go together. It's a classic combination, isn't it? It goes back centuries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and all those books are available in, in all good bookshops. Uh, once the bookshops oh, are back open and online, presumably. Yeah, online. Yeah, you can get them online on bookshops. Um, just follow me on social media. I'm constantly um, plugging them and promoting them all the time as well. Um, and book two, book two, you know, is uh, the special thing about book two. And right I on key with the plug. <laughs> yeah, 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 with the plug. No, no, but the real, the, the, the real, the real thing about book two is all of um, the first year's profits, um, plus my fee, I've donated to BBC Children in Need. You know, so every copy of uh, Cyborg Cat and the Night Spider uh, that you buy uh, goes towards helping children all over the UK who, who, who need it. So um, I think it's important in many, many ways. Any more in the pipeline as well? You're allowed to mention those? Um, or? Well, yeah, well, I've got, I mean, book three is The Master Marauder. That, that one was the latest book that came out on World Book Day earlier this year. Unfortunately, um, we couldn't really do any publicising of it because the day that uh, a week after it came out, we all went into lockdown and all the shops shut down. So, you know, no one's, yeah. no one's probably had a chance to know anything about this book. But I think this is probably, it, it, it's, it was one of my favourites to write. It was a lot of fun to write. And there are, there are plans for book four. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's just all this uh, negotiation stuff um, yeah. with publishers because my book deal was a three book deal. Um, and it's now all, all about, you know, trying to negotiate and work out what we're going to do um, for the next few books. Uh, but all parties are keen. Um, yeah. So oh, it's, it's promising. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've got, got, I've got, I've got lots of ideas, lots of ideas for which, a book four as well. Which is the start. And so, in the meantime, uh, people listening to this and watching this have got a bit of time to to read the first three books uh, and put a bit of pressure on yeah. you to get that fourth one out. Um, yes. I'd like to move on to actually a very important subject. Uh, finding the balance because you, you're talking about constantly forcing yourself to to be creative to to push yourself to live stream to you know make these challenging documentaries how do you switch off <laughs> do you do you switch off is probably a better question yeah it's it, it, it's, it's it's a good question because um i can switch off i can completely switch off um the easiest way for me to switch off i've found is to get away from it all is to you know, either get out of London, um, you know, switch off uh, my phone or get out of the country and, you know, turn off. I've started turning off the no notifications on my phone. You know, I, I made that mistake and I, I do when I'm in full work mode where 
all my notifications are on. So I'll be getting news notifications. I'll be getting social media notifications. I'll be getting um, email notifications. So my phone is constantly Just pinging, ping, 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 and ping, yeah. ping, 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 ping. And I'm absorbing all this information. And I'm, what, one thing that I'm really good at is, you know, as part of my job, is taking in quite a lot of detailed information very quickly. Um, and so I would constantly be there. And, I, and then by the end of the day, I'd feel really heavy. My brain would feel heavy because it was laden with so much information. So I started switching off the notifications. I started trying to use my phone a lot less on weekends. And I've been doing, uh, you know, as you've seen with my live streams, I didn't just have the Cyborg Cat live streams. I had a Fitness Friday live stream, but I also uh, started doing a mindfulness live stream on Mondays with a friend of mine um, called Gaz Chowdhury, who, plays, who I used to play wheelchair basketball with. And he's been doing mindfulness or practicing mindfulness for about 11 years. So we do a mindful Monday, you know, where I'm learning to, and I basically, you know, he teaches me and I do a mindfulness exercise, which kind of, you would have thought you'd never get away with it on, on everyday TV. Just uh, a, a one guy staring at a screen with his eyes closed, breathing heavily, whilst another guy um, gives you instructions about follow your breath. I mean, can you imagine that on, 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 on BBC One at prime time? It's not happening, I think that's, it? But, that's watershed by the, the sounds of your description. <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, that, that's the beauty of live streams is you can get to do that. And uh, it's had a really amazing response. You know, lots of people have, you know, uh, contacted us, DM'd us. And whilst it's happening, you know, um, just talking about how useful it was for them. And it's been useful for me, teaching me how to empty, uh, uh, not even how to empty my brain, but how to just be and how yeah. to just accept you know, what, what's going on, you know, not to be burdened by it, you know, but just to be in the moment and just to say, well, yeah, you know, I can hear a noise coming from here as a thought in my mind about what I'm going to do next. Oh, I've forgotten to do that. In the past, I would be very much starting to get more and more tense thinking mm. about these things and more stressed. Now, when I try and use the mindfulness practices, I'm, I'm less worried about them. I'm just like, well, this is it. And I will deal with them as they happen. Yeah, and those, and, step back and, and get a different of, perspective and puts everything into place. And yeah, it puts everything, off, doesn't it? Yeah, it puts everything into place and, and helps you just, you know, relax more and enjoy life more. Oh, great. Um, it sounds like I know the answer to this question, but are there any lessons you've learned during lockdown that you think you will carry forward into a post lockdown era whenever, whenever that comes about, if there ever will be one properly? Yeah, lessons. Well, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say lessons, but I've kind of started to understand that, um, you know, creativity is not something that you can just switch off and switch on it's there you know and you shouldn't you, you you shouldn't be worried or feel that it's going to be curbed by changes you know um also to uh, it's something that i've i've done quite a lot and had to deal with quite a lot in my life is to to deal with change to deal with big changes you know and we've had massive massive changes um, over the last six months as as a whole as a country um, and understanding you know that those changes it, it's not the end of the world um, and we and we can deal with those changes and we will always find a way to to overcome but also to 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 make things work within these really to to tumultuous times um and then i appreciate appreciate what we have more you know the fact that there was a period of time where we were only allowed one um one hour of exercise a day you know um and 
yeah, the, the fact that we got to spend, you know, some of us, you know, I was lucky enough to spend more time with my wife. Um, uh, but I know other people who lived on their own didn't have that, that, that fortunate. So it was more to appreciate, appreciate life more. Because I, I, I tend to think what was happening before lockdown for all of us is we were all caught up in this, um, in this wheel, in this wheel of life where we were being controlled by the elements of life, controlled by work, controlled by the, econo the economy, uh, controlled by the news cycle. Uh, whereas now, this is a moment, <laughs> I don't even want to say it, <laughs> for us to take back control. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but not, not, not even to take back control, but a moment for us to, 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 to just appreciate what we have. You know, and 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 not not be discombobulated and thrown off by the madness that we were living in. Because if you look back now, Booty, and you think, okay, life has been different. Um, maybe economically it hasn't been great, but I think we were all bonkers before lockdown. We were all running around like nutters, you know, and and, and you kind chicken. of got to think, yeah, headless chicken. Yeah, you got to pay the bills. But ultimately, there were a lot of things that we were like, think, for what? You know, most people, oh, I've got to get in a pub. I've got to have my drink on the weekend. I've got to have my takeaway. I've got to get to the restaurant. I've got to do this. Got to... No, you don't. No, you don't. We've, we've gone without all of that for seven months. And, and, and most of us have been, if, uh, I mean, absolutely, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to everyone who has suffered from COVID, who have been struck down, people who have lost, people you know it, it's just sad it's heartbreaking and it's something that i don't wish upon anybody um and and my condolences to every family out there that's had to deal with it but for the people who haven't you know um and who've gone without those things that we thought were so essential before lockdown it hasn't been the end of the world has it <laughs> yeah yeah we've survived and I think that's a, a really good way to finish this podcast is just to take a step back and look at what we have and appreciate what we do have and realize that there are lots of positives to come out of this strange, the, the weirdest period I think I've ever lived through. Um, hopefully it will be the, the, the strangest period I ever, ever have to live through. Mm. Um, but, you know, little things that we did take for granted back in January and February that now it's all in all been put in, into perspective the the little things like family um friends and just being able to relax and just reassess and i mm. think i think that's one of the the big things that i'll be taking home from this last few uh, few months and just questioning why i do things and what i don't know what am i getting out of it yeah exactly and i and, and one more thing which i think is really important and i i, I don't think our uh, our leaders are, 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 are making it uh, as apparent and as important as it should be, is in the fact that as much as we'd like to think uh, we're, we're, we're living in this world where only our bubble matters, actually we're in a global interconnected world. And what happens thousands and thousands of miles away no, is no longer insignificant to us it can affect us. You know, this began in a country thousands of miles away on the other side of the world, and it's affected the whole world. So we need to care and understand and take more notice of what's going on in the world and, and how it can affect the rest of the world as, as with what we do ourselves, the impact that we can have on, on the rest of the world. We are a global interconnected um, planet and the only way we are going to solve the big problems that we have and that we're going to face in the future is together and what a, a great way to end this podcast Adi you've been a, a superb guest thank you so so much for coming on lockdown booty calls I hope to be able to catch up with you in person soon and we can yes. you know, share a drink yes. and actually talk yes. about some of the stories that we were we were about to go into and making this into a, a six hour podcast so uh, <laughs> I wish you all the best with your creative endeavors and I hope to see you soon 
No, thank you, Booty. Um, I hope um, work comes streaming back in for you. And this has been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And yeah, let's catch up for that drink soon. Sounds good, mate. Tug easy. Cheers. Peace. This is a lockdown. <laughs> Booty call.